Hey, you guys, Scott Horton here to remind you that it's fun drive time at the Institute right now. We only do this twice a year, but it's got to be done. And I'm proud to do it, too. We've got an incredible crew of the best writers, authors, and podcasters in the libertarian movement. From Jim Bovard, Lori Calhoun, Tom Woods, and Ted Carpenter, to Keith Knight, Kyle Anzalone, Hunter Dorensis, Connor Freeman, and all the rest of the guys. It's the best team around. We've published three books this year. Keith Knight's Voluntarist Handbook, Lori Calhoun's Questioning the COVID Company Line, and Joseph Solis Mullins, The Fake China Threat. And here any day now, we will be publishing Thomas E. Wood's Diary of a Psychosis, Jim Bovard's Last Rites, and Keith Knight's latest, Domestic Imperialism. That makes 13 books so far, with more coming in the new year, including my new one, Provoked, How Washington Started the New Cold War with Russia and the Catastrophe in Ukraine, which, I know, is already overlong and overdue, but I'm working on it, I promise. And which brings me to the point, we don't have a big glass office building in downtown Washington. The money we raise goes straight to payroll and book production costs, and that's about it. The Libertarian Institute is the best bang for your buck in the movement. If you believe in what we're doing, please go to libertarianinstitute.org slash donate for details on how you can help keep us going into the new year and the great kickbacks we offer as well. And we thank you for your support. All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys. Time to welcome back to the show Mohammed Sahimi. He is a professor of uh, chemical engineering, I believe it is, at USC in uh, L.A. And he has written for uh, quite a long time now, more than 10 years. He's been writing uh, for all different outlets, including antiwar.com. And uh, now at Responsible Statecraft uh, and specializing in Iran, his home country, the politics there in Iran, as well as, of course, Iran's relationship with the United States. Welcome back to the show, Mohammed. How are you, sir? I'm fine. It's great to be back in your program, Scott. Uh, good, good. Very happy to have you here. And I was happy to see this great piece at Responsible Statecraft analyzing what is going on in Iran right now, and particularly in regards to the uh, war, such as it is, uh, Israel's war, as one-sided as it is uh, now, in uh, Gaza, or against Gaza. Now, of course, to hear the Hawks tell it, the Ayatollah is always behind everything, and anyone who wonders whether that's true is automatically working for the Ayatollah or something, I don't know. But uh, they don't ever seem to usually uh, show any evidence. We're just supposed to understand that because Iran provides some support for Hamas, as well as, of course, for Hezbollah, that they are, you know, as uh, Michael Ledeen would say, the terror masters behind everything. But uh, I know you're very clued in to uh, what's happening in Iranian politics there. So I wonder what a reasonable take might sound like. Well, first of all, the point I was trying to make in that piece is that unlike what many people think, Hamas is not a puppet of the Islamic Republic of Iran. They have their own agenda, they have their own uh, um, policy and they make their own decision. And in fact, when the Syrian civil war was going on between 2011 and 2018, Hamas um, um, supported the uh, opposition to Bashar al-Assad government rather than siding with Bashar al-Assad, even though Hamas was supposedly an ally of Iran, and we all know that Iran supported uh, Bashar al-Assad regime uh, in Syria. And that angered, actually, Iranian leadership to the point that they cut off all aids to Hamas uh, for, for several years. 
and only in the past couple of years that there was some sort of a rapprochement between the two. Um, but before that, the, uh, the, uh, the relations have uh, cooled off um, very much. And in fact, in the current conflict, Hamas leadership has been reported to be angry because Iranian Supreme Leader uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said that uh, Iran is not going to enter the war. Neither uh, is uh, Iran's main ally in the Middle East, the Lebanese Hezbollah. So that's one point that we have to remember that uh, Hamas is not Iran's puppet and uh, Iran does support Hamas in some ways or another, but they, they make their own decision. And in fact, there were many reports that uh, that said that US officials and Israeli officials said that they are unaware of any evidence uh, that showed that Iran actually uh, took part in planning the uh, attack that Hamas carried out against Israel on October 7th. And uh, there was also a report that Iranian leaders were as surprised as Israeli or American leaders when the uh, uh, attacks happened. Uh, Sheikh Hassan Nasrullah, uh, the leader of uh, Lebanese uh, Hezbollah, said as much. He said he didn't know about it. And in fact, he said one reason that the attack was successful in their uh, in their eyes, uh, from their perspective, is that um, nobody outside Hamas leadership and the people who took part in it uh, knew about it. Uh, so that's that's one point. The other point is that the way they uh, create an image of Iran uh, in the West, particularly in the United States, is that. This is a country where um, you know everybody has white eyes and everybody has a gun that wants to go and fight with Israel. Uh, that's actually not true. Uh, Iranian politics is very dynamic, it's very complex. There are all sorts of political factions from way right to way left, and they all have uh, different opinions about uh, you know, the Middle East and what to do about Iranian allies and Israel and the United States. Uh, and therefore, this is not a, a monolithic country in which uh, anything that the Supreme Leader says uh, is carried out. Uh, to the contrary, it is in fact, despite uh, censorship and despite all other restrictions that uh, uh, the hardliners uh, put on uh, social media and websites and so on, uh, there is always fierce uh, debates going on inside here particularly when it comes to foreign policy and particularly when it comes to the Middle East. And the war between Hamas and Israel is no exception. There are also sorts of opinions about what to do with it. But generally speaking, you can, again, as usual, divide them into two camps. And one camp is a hardliner, and one camp is the moderates, reformists, leftists, and uh, nationalists, and so on. Both camps uh, agree on certain points, but there are also major differences between the two camps. Uh, for example, they both agree that uh, they should support the rights of Palestinian people, but while the radicals uh, support uh, giving arms, for example, to Palestinians, the uh, moderates and the reformists and the rest uh, support uh, giving them political support and humanitarian uh, humanitarian uh, aid. Uh, former Foreign Minister Mohammed Yawaz Zaif said in a speech last week that, uh, yes, we should support uh, Palestinian people. But supporting Palestinian people does not mean that we should fight war for them. It only means that we should support them in whatever they want to do, uh, politically and otherwise. And if you want to give them uh, uh, any help or aid, it should be humanitarian. He also said that Iranian people are tired of paying the price for arming the Palestinians, which uh, the Israeli lobby uh, in the United States uses uh, in order to push for more pressure uh, on Iran, more economic sanctions uh, against Iran, and even uh, threat of war. So there are there are points of conflicts within Iran. And uh, in addition to that, and the final point that I want to make is that uh, Khamenei said in a speech that Iran did not take part. And in fact, there was a meeting of Iran's Supreme National Security Council in which it was decided that Iran not only did not uh, take part uh, in the in the current war, but also all officials were banned uh, from uh, making any statement that could be interpreted directly or indirectly uh, as meaning that Iran intends to enter the war or Iran you know, intends to do something that intensifies the war. Uh, so that that's these are the things that are not reflected in the United States and the West, but these are the uh, realities within Iran. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, one thing is, you know, we, we know from years of experience that no matter what happens over there, the Hawks are going to always blame Iran for it, especially if it's a Shiite who does it. So, for example, yes. there are attacks by alleged uh, Shiite militias. I guess it makes sense that they are Shiite militias rather than ISIS or al-Qaeda types who've attacked American forces in Iraq and Syria. But to the Hawks, it just goes without saying that if they're Shiites, then the Ayatollah made them do it. But I wonder if you think there's any real reason to believe that that's true. Uh, no, not necessarily. Because, for example, Shiite in Iraq, although they are supported by Iran, but they also have their own agenda because they they do things that are not in Iran's interest. But they consider um, doing those things as being in Iraq's interest. Uh, because after all, they are Iraqis. They are Shiites, but they are first and foremost they are, uh, Iraqis. Um, so uh, it is. It is not true that uh, uh, you know whatever they do, they take the orders uh, from Tehran. Tehran supports them. Uh, uh, Tehran uh, gives them funds. Um, um, Tehran gives them arms. But at the same time, they have their own agenda. Uh, so if Shia do, uh, do something uh, against uh, what the United States calls their interests, it may or may not may not be supported by you. Uh, it, it doesn't follow necessarily that whatever Shiites do, the orders have come from Tehran. They yeah. have their own agenda. They have their own nation. They have their own interests. Uh, and uh, it happens uh, many times that their own interests conflicts with what uh, Tehran wants. And despite that, they go ahead and, and, and do uh, uh, whatever they decide to do. And in fact, in the past, many times, uh, Iran has been... Uh, forced to send uh, high officials uh, to these countries where Shiites uh, are allied with Iran and ask them to not to do uh, the, uh, such things because uh, uh, they think that it is not in their interest and it's not in Tehran's interest. So it doesn't follow that whatever Shiites do uh, is on the order by, by Tehran. Yeah. And in fact, you know, now that it's been two months of this almost, we can see what's not happening right if the ayatollah had come up with mm -hmm. this evil conspiracy and plan then we right. would see all these pieces moving in a way especially uh, an attack which kicked off this latest round of violence yes if you start the clock on the seventh but i am for the sake of argument here that this current round of violence was kicked off on the seventh and if the ayatollah was making his move then we would see what something drastic would be happening in Syria right now, in Iraq right now? Hezbollah would have made a move instead of Nasrallah, their leader, giving a speech about how I'm not making a move. And there have been tit for tat attacks at the northern border there, but apparently both sides are signaling to each other that they're not trying to escalate to a real war conflict, uh, despite those tit for tat attacks. So in other words, you know, if this is the Tom Clancy novel where the Ayatollah is behind it all, we would be seeing all these things happening right now in order to escalate the whole thing into some kind of, you know, regional conflict of one kind or another with some, with some real end in mind. And we just are not seeing that at all. And in fact, what we're seeing is it looks to me, Mohammed, like Hamas is really trying to put all of their potential friends and allies in a corner and make them choose by sharpening the contradictions between Israel and their neighboring states here. And probably, if anything, Nasrallah and uh, Khamenei resent Hamas sort of putting them in a difficult spot without asking. Yes, and in fact, there was a report, uh, although it was denied by Hamas, but there was a report from a credible uh, source in Tehran that in a meeting that Khamenei had with uh, Ismail al Haniya, uh, who is the uh, political leader of Hamas and who lives in Qatar, uh, just last week or 10 days ago, in which Khamenei actually told Haniya that they, they, Hamas has made uh, a strategic mistake by attacking Israel at this time, because in Khamenei's view, the US forces were gradually leaving the, uh, the Middle East um, after what has happened and after. Uh, after Iran, for example, uh, tried to mend its relation with Saudi Arabia and Arab nations of the Persian Gulf, but 
uh, Hamas attacking Israel uh, has uh, prompted uh, the Biden administration to rush uh, U.S. forces, U.S. Navy to the Mediterranean Sea and uh, U.S. weapons to Israel. And that may not be in the long run in the interest of uh, Palestinian people. So there was this and there was this uh, report also. The other thing I would like to point out is that often uh, neocons and uh, those who want war with Iran in the United States do is they, you know, they cite or refer to what this or that official in Tehran or, you know, uh, Majesty deputy or uh, some sort of second or third rate official say about the war. And they say, look, what they said is we are going to do this and we are going to do that. But this, all of these statements should be viewed in the context of Iranian politics, which is uh, hugely factional. In other words, uh, people say things uh, that uh, is for uh, internal consumption only. Uh, they have competition uh, between, uh, within their own camp, and they also have competition with the opposition camp. And therefore, in order to uh, uh, in order to uh, outmaneuver uh, their competitors, they make the statements that are purely uh, for internal consumption, but uh, it is used outside Iran to point finger at Iran, uh, saying that this just goes to show what evil they are and so on. For example, Foreign Minister, Iranian Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdullah at the beginning of the conflict, uh, said that you know uh, many uh, of Iran's allies in the Middle East have their fingers on, on the trigger, and if the war uh, spreads further, uh, they are all, also ready to enter the war. Uh, but basically, uh, right after what he said uh, in his speech, Khomeini said flatly that uh, Iran is not going to uh, get involved in this in this war. And one of the uh, uh, most senior uh, officers of uh, IRGC, um, Islam Revolution in uh said that we don't want to interwar with uh, the United States or Israel simply because uh, if, if we do, they will come and bomb us and 10, 15,000 people will be killed and the development, economic development of the country will be set back uh, 15, 20 years. So we don't want any war. And just as when they killed uh, two major uh, general Hossein Soleimani, who was uh, the most senior military officer in Iran by Trump on 6th of January 2020, he said we could have attacked all U.S. Uh, bases in, in the Middle East, but we didn't because we want to avoid war and we don't want uh, civilians and innocent people get killed. Yeah. So these are all you know, evidence and the statements that senior officials make that Iran is not, uh, uh, is not uh, does not intend to enter the war. And in fact, as I said, and I'm sure you know that uh, Iran said that we were not uh, aware that uh, Hamas was going to attack Israel and they were as surprised as anybody. Uh, but uh, still, as I said in the piece, as soon as the attacks happened, uh, all the neocons and uh, supporters of war pointed towards Iran as if Iran is responsible. Mm -hmm. As I said in my piece, uh, look, the Palestinian Israel problem emerged in 1948 when Israel was founded. This was 30 years before the Iranian Revolution. And in fact, in the 1980s, the revolution in Iran and Israel secretly worked together because Israel, through the contract, sent Iran some weapons and Ayatollah Khomeini accepted those weapons. It was only in 1993, after the Oslo Agreement, that Yitzhak Rabin, who was Israeli prime minister, uh, had decided that since Israel had made uh, peace with Palestine Liberation Organization and therefore PLO was not uh, uh, Israel enemy number one, uh, Israel needed another enemy number one, and they decided to make Iran enemy number one, and of course Iranian leaders uh, responded to it. These are all actually explained very nicely, documented by Trita Parsi in, in his in his. Alliance. Yeah, I was so just it was say actually, that. in my view, uh, as yes, it was Israel who actually started this in 19 after 1993 because they yeah. they needed an external enemy and all around which the Israeli people can unite. And they thought that okay, now we have made peace with PLO, 
and we also have airport, and therefore the next one in line to be to become our number one enemy is Iran. So they have started, and unfortunately, Iranian leaders also, uh, you know, uh, uh, brought the debate and, and and got involved in this. But we have to remember all this history uh, behind, uh, you know, all the uh, enmity that we have uh, between Iran and Israel. Mm-hmm. And uh, don't forget that uh, a lot of these things were, uh, were started by Israel, not by the Islamic Republic of Iran. As much as I distaste Iranian regime in Tehran, as much as I oppose Iranian regime in Tehran, because of which I haven't been to Iran for almost two decades, uh, we have to remember what the history tells us. And the history tells us that it was Israel who started this uh, after 1993, after agreement. Uh, Trito Parsi explained this uh, excellently in his book. Yeah. And by the way, I love talking about that book. I'm glad you brought it up. I'll take every chance that I have to mention it. It's the deepest dive on this subject matter, and it is some yes. mind blowing stuff. Treacherous Alliance by Trita Parsi. I just asked him about it last week, in fact, again. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm 99% that this is where I got that is out of that book. That the current Ayatollah, because he's been in power since the old man died in eighty nine, it's been yeah. Khamenei, and I'm I'm almost certain it was he who said that, hey, look, I can't be more Catholic than the Pope, if the Palestinians, and he's referring to Arafat back then, if the Palestinians want to negotiate and accept just twenty two percent, then that's up to them, and we'll support them in that, and we will that's make cool. them accept that, but if they want to accept that, what are we gonna do? Tell him that's not good enough. Come on, <laughs> you know, which is makes him seem a little bit less the uh, flag burning lunatic from the Nightline clips. You know, that's that's not only that's correct. Uh, there is also other episodes that are not reflected here, and in fact, I have written about them in the past uh, mm-hmm. in, in, in English pieces. You know what I or, like about it too, Mohammed? Is it's not just right, but it's funny. Like, who would have thought the Supreme Ayatollah has a sense of humor and is going to make a Pope joke about the Palestinians' yes. position? You know what I mean? It humanizes them a bit. I like it. Yes, even, even Khomeini himself, who was supposedly the number one anti-American uh, person on the face of the air, uh, he said that uh, we are not supposed to be uh, 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 you know, enemy of the United States forever. At some point, we will have to amend our relationship with the United States. And I'm sure if he had to stay around uh, a few years later, after the Iran-Iraq war ended, and he uh, died less than a year after the war ended, uh, he may have uh, he may have taken the first uh, steps towards many the relationship with the United States. But then what, what I was going to say is that. Uh, there, there is also uh, this um, uh, true story that I wrote about um, a few years ago. There was this uh, Iranian minister and diplomat uh, that was um, thrown in jail uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, he, was, he was thrown in jail as a result of factional politics within Iran. And from jail, he wrote a letter uh, to the Supreme Leader Khamenei in which he said that, I don't understand uh, why I'm in jail. Uh, it was on your order that I met with an Israeli minister in such and such conference. It was on your order that I gave them the message that uh, we want to le- uh, lessen the tension between uh, the two countries. He made a lot of his statements. He said, and th- the point he was making was that everything that I did is because you asked me to do it, which means that Khamenei behind the scenes, uh, you know, secret from almost everybody else was trying to lessen the tension because he recognized that uh, as long as that tension exists, uh, the economic sanctions are not going to be lifted and the threat of uh, military attack will always be there. And given that Israeli society is going rightward and becoming more and more extreme, he probably thought that maybe we should try to take some steps. But these are not reflected here in the West uh, because they don't want to distort the distorted image of Iran that they have made as people in which, uh, you know, a country in which everybody uh, wants to pick up a gun and, and, and fight with Israel on behalf of the Palestinians, which is far from, uh, from the truth. Yeah, sorry. Hang on just one second. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for Tennessee Hot Sauce Company. Man, this stuff is so good. They get all different flavors. 
garlic habanero, honey habanero, pineapple habanero, poblano jalapeno, and the blood orange ghost. They're all so good, I swear. And for a limited time, Tennessee Hot Sauce Company is featuring official Scott Horton Hotter Than the Sun thermonuclear hot sauce. It's full of Carolina Reapers, Scorpion Peppers, Dr. Pepper, Hydrogen Isotopes, and all kinds of things that'll burn your tongue clean off. Seriously, it's really good. Get yourself a hot sauce subscription. Spend $40 or more and use promo code SCOTT to get a free bottle of Hotter Than the Sun hot sauce. That's tnhotsauceco.com. Hey, y'all got to check out these awesome busts of our hero, the great Ron Paul. They're made by the renowned sculptor Rick Casali. They're 13 inches tall, hand-painted bronze resin based on Casali's brilliant original. Y'all may have seen mine in the background on my bookshelf in some recent interviews. The thing is unbelievable. Check out this incredible piece of art at rickcasali.com slash ronpaul and you'll see what I mean. Use promo code Horton and you'll save 25 bucks. And this show will get a little kickback too. That's rickcasali.com slash ronpaul. Casali is C-A-S-A-L-I. rickcasali.com slash ronpaul. And there's free shipping too. All right, so can you talk to us a little bit about President Ibrahim Raisi? I don't know as much about him as some of his predecessors here. Well, he was basically handpicked by Khamenei uh, because the goal was um, to basically make a unified um, government. Before him, we had Rouhani as president, and Rouhani didn't agree with Khamenei in, in a lot of ways. And in fact, uh, when he was negotiating uh, the nuclear agreement with the United States, he had crossed um, several red lines that Khamenei uh, had set for him. And in fact, I wrote about this in Huffington Post several years ago. He said the uh, nuclear agreement with the United States is actually uh, you know, a defeat for Khamenei because many of his red lines were crossed by Rouhani and his foreign minister, Mohammad Javazai. That, of course, angered uh, Khamenei and the hardliners. And when Trump reimposed the sanctions and exited from, uh, from the nuclear agreement, they decided that they don't want to be in a situation whereby uh, you know, the official state, official government says something and the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme leader says something else. So they basically made sure that the next, in the next presidential election, in the election of 2021, they decided that they want to bring somebody to presidency that would be one of their own. Uh, and for that purpose, uh, basically Khamenei handpicked uh, Ibrahim Reis. He's a hardliner, uh, uh, in my view, and the view of many, uh, his government has done terribly. Uh, he, he made a lot of promises when he was running for election. The election was not basically uh, the type of elections that we usually had in Iran. Elections in Iran are, are, have never been democratic, but they were usually competitive in the sense that we had different candidates from different factions, and we couldn't really predict in advance who it's going to be. But this time, uh, everybody knew that uh, Raisi would be elected. And for that reason, uh, a lot of people stayed home and didn't vote. Um, typically, the turnout in Iranian elections, especially for presidential election, was about 65%. Uh, this time it was about 48%. And in fact, they said that uh, eight or 9% of it was, uh, was uh, canceled, canceled votes. So basically about 40% of the people uh, voted and he got elected by uh, half of that, which is 20% of, of the electorate. So he, he's basically Khamenei's man, Khamenei's front man. And uh, he's a hardliner uh, and uh, his government is, in terms of uh, at least economy, uh, let alone everything else, has done very terribly. Uh, the economy has not improved. Uh, he had promised to do a lot of things to uh, reduce inflation, reduce unemployment, uh, and, and so on, build houses for people, and so on. None of them uh, has, uh, has happened, even though since Joe Biden uh, started his presidency, Iran's oil uh, exports have increased dramatically. Uh, basically, Biden has turned his uh, his eye on the other. Uh, he said the other side and allow Iran to uh, uh, export oils to some extent. So Iran has had better uh, oil exports and better income, but still, Raisi has not done well. And in fact, and, and of course, we had 
last year's uh, demonstrations uh, against against the state after Mahsar, I mean, the young uh, Iranian girl uh, uh, died while he was in detention. Uh, and that also galvanized a lot of people to come and protest. And the protests actually were not so much about Mahsar Amini, uh, although that she provided the, uh, the excuse for it, but it was about the bad economic conditions, bad foreign policy, and, and so on and so forth. So Raisi is basically communist man. Now, the, I think the most crucial thing that is going to happen in the next two, three years is that, in my view, as far as I know, and based on all the information that uh, we have, Khamenei is going to die over the next two, three years. Uh, he's sick, he, he has cancer, and they say that his cancer has spread. So there is a lot of maneuver behind the scene uh, about who will succeed him. Uh, and depending on who will succeed him, uh, the direction of Iran's foreign policy and even internal policy may completely change. So this is a very important thing that a lot of people are waiting on to see what's going on. And of course, as usual, there, there is a lot of maneuver by uh, different political factions. Uh, Hassan Rouhani, the former president, just announced that he's running in the election for Assembly of Experts. Assembly of Experts is a constitutional body that when Khamenei dies, will choose the next uh, uh, supreme leader. So he wants to uh, uh, participate in the election for that assembly so that when Khamenei dies, he will be there. And they say that uh, all the reports from Iran indicate that he's trying to organize his supporters among um, the, the Shia clergy uh, so that when Khamenei dies, maybe he will, he will have a chance to become supreme leader. And if he does become supreme leader, of course, it would be very good for Iran uh, it would be good for the, um, uh, for uh, foreign policy of Iran. It would be good for Iranian people because he's much more moderate than Khamenei and he wants to have good relations not only with Europe, but also with, with the United States. Yeah, man. Well, um, and now, so uh, last on the list here, I think it's important. You mentioned in your piece here the former foreign minister, Zarif, I'm sorry, I just blanked on his name. I know it, Javad Zarif. Um, yes. He he uh, said explicitly he had this uh, whole thing. You linked to the the whole statement. I guess he's a professor now, and and he was really denouncing what was going on. But he also said that listen, this is not you know explicitly our problem. As upset about it as we might be, essentially, is that about right? Exactly. That's what he said. He said. He said, of course, we should uh, support uh, the right of Palestinian people because even Iranian constitution says that. But supporting the Palestinian people does not mean that we should go and uh, fight for them or we should even arm them. It, it only means that uh, we should support uh, whatever they want to do, the political rights, humanitarian aid, and so on. Uh, it is not our war. Uh, it is their war. And uh, the best, and the other thing that he said was, which was very important, was that we sh the best thing that we can do for Palestinian people is to create a condition so that Israel cannot accuse them of uh, uh, accuse them of being our proxy. Um, accept the fact that they are fighting for their own independence and their own state, rather than doing the fight for us. And for that, uh, it, it means that. Uh, we shouldn't fight for them, uh, allow them to fight for themselves, but we should, of course, support their political rights, their uh, human rights. And if you want to give them any aid, any help, it should be humanitarian. That's what, what Zarif said. And in fact, uh, this, this was, uh, this made a huge uh, wave within Iran and, uh, uh, and uh, hardliners attacked him, of course, as usual. But uh, he made a great point, and that, uh, that has resonated. Uh, uh, with a lot of people inside you. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a debate about Palestine recently, and the guy said, and I'm not even picking on him, I guess I'll just pick on the right in general, maybe, or half of it, at least, that there's just sort of this ingrained belief that, oh, Iran, they just hate us. In fact, I remember, Mohammed, one time I was uh, getting my air conditioner fixed in my truck, and the guy started telling me, and he had no idea I was anti-war.com guy or anything, he just started explaining to me. It was all the terrible things that Bill Clinton did in the 1990s, bombing Iraq from bases in Saudi. That's what turned Al-Qaeda against us and got our towers knocked down. 
And I'm like, word up. This truck air conditioner repairman really knows his stuff, you know? And he wasn't excusing <laughs> he wasn't excusing bin Laden. He was just saying, this is blowback from American foreign policy, you know? And then he said, but Iran, <laughs> they just hate us. They hate us. And he didn't know about the coup of 53, I guess. And he didn't know about, you know, the, the 25 years of the Shah with American support and much less American support for Saddam in the Iran-Iraq war. Or maybe he did. I don't know. But the idea was, and this is, I'm sorry, now I'm conflating my repairman with the guy I was in the debate with. The guy I was in the debate with said, well, they just hate us. And essentially, there's no point in believing that America could just have a normalized relationship with Iran where we just are not best friends, but just get along just like we get along with any other state around there, that they are essentially our implacable enemies because of all the terrible things built in about them. And I know you're no apologist for that regime, and neither am I, but all I'm asking here is about the reality of the potential for America to get along with the very bad men who run Iran just as well as our government gets along with the very bad men that run lots of different states in the world? Or is this just cartoonish super villainy that we can do nothing but contain until Armageddon comes when, when we finally break out the big bombs? No, even even Khamenei, who basically leads the heart right there, although he is in many, many cases, is more moderate than, than the core of Iranian heartlands. Even he said that when the nuclear negotiations were going on, he said that, okay, if you reach a nuclear agreement with the United States, then you will wait to see whether the United States delivers on, it, on its obligations, on its promises. If it does, then we can start negotiations about other things. Even he said that. He said that this is the state where we, that the United States can show whether they actually have good intention towards you. Uh, we agreed to limit our nuclear program. We agreed to uh, uh, freeze a lot of activities. Uh, we agreed to put it under a strict inspection of International Atomic Energy Agency. And in return, the United States is supposed to lift a lot of sanctions and, and do other things. So if they do, then we will see what happens. If they do, then we can negotiate other things. We can inter-negotiate other things. But as we all know, Trump came to office. He took the United States out of a nuclear agreement. He imposed not only the sanctions, but he basically, he and Mike Pompeo had this policy of maximum pressure uh, confronting Iran at every corner, uh, which, uh, created a lot of huge economic difficulty for Iranian people. And in fact, it was then that Khomeini said, well, as I told you all the time, we cannot trust the United States. See what happened. We reached agreement. We delivered on our promises and obligation. Even Iran waited a year after uh, Trump announced that uh, the United States was exiting the nuclear agreement. Iran had waited for one more year. In other words, Iran uh, implemented its obligation towards Africa for one more year. And they called it at that time a strategic patience. So they uh, basically demonstrated a strategic patience with the hope that, that Trump will be convinced to come back. But Trump didn't come back because uh, our is in the United States didn't want to. And, and here is the situation that we have. Yep. And what a shame. You know what, though? This brings up one last point before I let you go, which is that the Hawks all say when Biden was softening up a little bit on this, he released some tax money. I'm not even sure if this was directly related to the nuclear talks. Um, this may have just been separate negotiations, but he released some of this money that had been withheld uh, by way of the sanctions, I guess. And then the Hawks all said, aha. This is the money that went into the Hamas attack, which obviously is not quite that simple. But I guess the idea being that unless we had a real normalized relationship with Iran contingent on them, quote unquote, behaving themselves in the region the way America wants them to, then all we're doing is essentially by allowing them to have this oil revenue or this uh, whatever it was, this this uh, supply of a few billion that they had seized and then had set up this account in Qatar 
uh, for the Iranians to have access to it, that it'll always just be seen as funding the enemy, right? In, in other words, it's almost like uh, the Leverett's book going to Tehran, where they said, unless we go to Tehran, shake hands, figure it out like Nixon did with Mao, that kind of thing, and just break the ice and figure out how to move forward from there, any half measure will only be seen as enabling and empowering the enemy and making everything worse. Well, but first of all, I, I should mention the $6 billion that we are talking about was Iran's own money. Iran had exported oil to South Korea. South Korea owed Iran $7 billion. But because of the sanction, the money had, had been frozen there. Then the U.S. agreed to allow this uh, six billion out of seven billion to be released, but not in, under Iranian control. They sent it to Qatar under the control of Qatar government, and Iran would ask the Qatar government to buy this or that, which are like med medication, food and stuff, and so on. Qatar would do it, pay for it, and then ship it to Iran. You know, that's one point. So it was Iran's money. But you, when Trump was president, he repeated this lie that we have, we gave you on $150 billion. First of all, it wasn't $150 billion, it was $55 billion. Second, it was Iran's own money that had been frozen. Third, Iran never got the $55 billion. By the time Obama left office, only a small fraction of it had been released to Iran. Even uh, John Kerry, I think. Now, the other point is that when Hamas attacked Israel, Iran hadn't even started to use the money in Qatar to, to buy food, medicine, and so on to import Iran. And after that, there were many reports indicating that uh, Qatar has uh, basically stopped at this, at this point, uh, not allowing the money to be used by Iran. And in fact, they passed a resolution in Congress, I think today or yesterday, that banning that. So, uh, Iran never got its money, Raiz, he never got uh, uh, the money for Iran. It was in Qatar, and Iran even didn't control it. It could, it could uh, use it only through Qatar to buy things, and that, that even that didn't happen. So this is our lies that, you know, we gave them money and they gave to Hamas. That, that's nonsense. The third point I would like to make is that, and they don't talk about it, is that most of Hamas budget actually comes from Arab countries. It comes from Qatar itself, it comes from Saudi Arabia, it comes from Jordan, it comes from Tunisia, and so on. Either privately or through various governmental organizations. It is not Iran that supplies most of the funds for Hamas, but it's Arab countries. But because those Arab regimes are U.S. friends, we don't talk about it. We only say Iran did this and Iran did that. No. Uh, as I said, as much as I despise the Iranian regime in Tehran, we have to look at the facts. Because if we ignore these facts, then that may lead to wars that we don't want. If we blame everything, uh, if, if we blame Iran for everything, and Iran is not to blame for everything, Iran has responsibility in certain cases, but not for everything, then we, we put ourselves in a situation when we might force to start a war with a country that is not at war with us. So these are all lies that uh, they say about Iran all the time, including the six billion that that uh, you brought up, and the fact of it is just uh, what I just told you. Uh, this was under Qatar's control. This was Iran's own money. You didn't give Iran any money, not even a penny, and uh, Iran didn't get to use it before Hamas attacked uh, uh, attacked Israel on October seventh. All right, Mohammed. Well, I will let you go. Uh, with that, but I sure appreciate your time on the show and uh, to see you writing here at responsiblestatecraft.com. Everyone, the piece is called Iran's political factions aren't united on Hamas or on the Middle East. So I uh, really appreciate you. And again, that's Mohammed Sahimi. Really appreciate your time on the show, Mohammed. Great to talk to you. Thank you, Scott, as, as always. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.